Welcome to this uh, video series on network psychometrics. Uh, this video series is a bit different. Uh, it will consist of a few videos on very different topics, and they're all uh, sort of hot topics in psychometrics. So psychometrics, if you don't know about it, is the field of study of uh, measuring psychological behavior and also the statistical analysis of psychological data sets. And in these video videos, I want to uh, talk about some hot topics that you see a lot of literature on uh, recently in psychometrics. Uh, mainly, I'll talk about uh, network modeling and latent variable modeling, so how these models relate to each other, uh, but also how you can combine them or introduce the psychometrics package that you can use that. And in psychometrics, you can also estimate models for time series data and panel data. Um, so uh, another part of this video series will be about the interpretation of network models based on different sources of data, like cross-sectional data, panel data, and time series data. And that will already introduce some concepts as well that we'll see in the next session on time series data in more uh, detail as well. In this video, I want to talk about the latent variable model and the network model, uh, and more specifically, how these two uh, frameworks relate to each other. So we have two different frameworks. We have the latent variable model, which is the common framework that we've been using in psychological research for the last uh, 100 years or so. And we have this network model, that is this more recent framework that uh, we discuss in this course. Now here we have a latent variable, and this latent variable causes covariation on these indicators, which are otherwise locally independent. In the network model, uh, we have direct interactions between these uh, observed uh, variables, and we generally don't have latent variable models, so or latent variables in there. So this seems like very different frameworks. But it turns out that these two frameworks are actually very closely related. We already learned about how directed networks relate to undirected networks. And we can see that a Markov random field, an undirected network model, is very similar to a directed network model. So if this model is the true model, the latent variable model, then the corresponding network model would be this undirected network model with the arrow edge removed. Now, here's a very uh, interesting uh, property, and that is that this does include a, a latent variable. Because according to the model on the left, um, the latent variable is what makes these items independent. So y1 is independent from y2 after um, conditioning on the latent variable. Now, typically in uh, network models, uh, we don't have latent variables. We only include observed variables. So what would that mean? What would be the resulting Markov random field? That would be a fully connected network. So if you generate data under the latent variable model, then the corresponding um, network model would be a fully connected network model. And this is actually something that many people don't uh, immediately see or realize. Many people think that if you generate data under the latent variable model, the network model would be empty. But that is not true, because we cannot condition on any other uh, a variable in the network to make the dependency between two uh, items go away. We would have to condition on the latent variable. And only if we increase the number of indicators to infinite, uh, then we would see an empty network. Otherwise, what you typically see is a cluster and actually a very strong cluster. It means also that these two models can be equivalent. And it also means another thing. That means that if data is generated under a fully connected network model, that we could fit a latent variable model to the data set and get a good fit. So that gives you an alternative explanation for patterns of data that we see already in psychology for a long time. Um, but because in, in 100 years of psychological research, we have been using these factor models a lot. And that's because everything tends to correlate positively with everything. And we can use them to explain the data patterns quite well. But this equivalence means that that doesn't mean that the latent variable model had to be a data generating model. Uh, that could also be a network model, which is a cluster of, um, of items. So this has pretty much been confirmed, this equivalence. We can confirm it uh, mathematically as well, which is a very strong and powerful thing. So the first, let's look at a Gaussian graph model and a confirmatory factor analysis model. This is a uh, relatively easy way to see this. We already learned that the Gaussian graph model can take this form. So we have a variance covariance matrix. And this variance covariance matrix, we can um, uh, model using uh, the angle scaling matrix, which just controls the variances of items, and this partial correlation network. 
The factor model, on the other hand, takes this form usually, which uh, you might know if you ever did a course in uh, factor analysis, where we have a variance covert matrix, which has factor loadings. It has uh, a factor variance covert matrix for the latent variables, and a residual variance covert matrix, which is usually diagonal. So then we can see that they are equivalent because they are both a model for sigma. So they're equivalent if uh, this uh, holds up. Now, since this uh, delta is a diagonal matrix, that means that this omega here um, can be used to uh, basically reconstruct whatever uh, this um, will give you. And usually, if you get clusters in this omega, or usually if you generate data in this factor model, you should get clusters in this data. And that's also explained in more detail in this paper by Hudson Colino and me. So that's it for the Gaussian case, which is relatively easy to understand because they're both models for variance cover spaces. For the Easing model and the multidimensional item response theory model, it, it is a bit more complicated. So there's a long proof, and you can read about it in, uh, in these papers. Uh, there's a long proof about this, uh, uh, which I won't really go into detail now, but the, basically this slide here uh, contains the, the gist of it. We have a, uh, an Easing model, which is represented here. And if we uh, take an eigenvalue decomposition here, then we can uh, restructure uh, these eigenvector matrices as discrimination parameters in the multinational item response theory model. And this will again lead to clusters in the network. Or actually, like every cluster will lead to a latent variable. So that means that again, these two modeling frameworks are equivalent. You see here a latent variable causing covariation on three items. And that is identical to this cluster here. We also see this latent variable here, which is identical to this cluster here. And this is explained in more detail also in this uh, very nice uh, paper by uh, Maarten Marsman, an introduction to network psychometrics relating easing models to item response theory models. So this brings me to what I like to call the fundamental rule of network psychometrics. And that is that clusters in the networks equal latent variables. And these clusters are more specifically rank one clusters. So they are structured in a certain way. But if you see a latent variable model and it generates the data, then you should see a cluster in the network. And this also means that if you ever look at the network and you see strong clustering in the network, then you can also immediately think, okay, so maybe this is just because it's a latent variable model after all, which could very well be the case, of course, right? You could have latent variables. And sometimes I see that, I see a network, and I, see, I look at it and I think, well, this is just basically a latent variable model. And this is a very powerful thing. So it's a very powerful thing to look at networks and in, uh, interpret them in this way. But also the other way around, we can uh, look at this network structure to get more insight in the factor structure underlying the data. And it is a, a powerful way that we can use networks in factor analysis without having to uh, take any causal interpretation or something about the network. So this brings us back to the very first paper uh, in my mind on network psychometrics, which is this paper from 2006 from Han van der Maas, who is um, uh, also working with us in the psychological methods group. And here, uh, what uh, Han van der Maas did is he took a uh, ecology um, analogy to general intelligence. So general intelligence, or the G-factor, has been used for quite a long time to explain co-variation between cognitive tests. And then uh, uh, Han van der Maas talked with ecologists, and then he asked them, okay, so you also see uh, positive correlations. So all these things tend to correlate positively with each other, which is the positive manifold. So Han van der Maas talked to ecologists and said, okay, you, you see these positive correlations as well in, for example, lakes. Like in a lake, you have like uh, high uh, oxygen in the water, you have plants in the water, you have lots of fish in the water, or all of these things low. Uh, so how do you explain that? And they don't explain that with a general factor for lakeness. Instead, the ecologists explain that with a mutualism model, where all these things are mutually beneficial for each other. If there are lots of plants in the water, then the fish have something to eat. If there are lots of fish in the water, then uh, they, uh, they, they clean the water again. So all these factors can mutually beneficially uh, increase each other. And it turns out that if you simulate data under a mutualism model where all these uh, factors uh, improve each other, you get exactly data that would fit a general factor model, which shows that there's an alternative explanation 
to data where the general factor model holds. And this leads to an argument that can be made quite often in many different fields of research. If you see a latent variable model to fit the data, it does not mean that the latent variable model is true. Likewise, if you see a nice network, it doesn't mean that the network perspective is true, because the latent variable could have also led to a nice network where everything is fully correlated or connected. And we wrote a bit about this in this uh, commentary on the p-factor for psychopathology. But just like in the intelligence world, there is now also a general factor for psychopathology, which is called the p-factor. And um, uh, there's quite some papers actually about this, and you see that this uh, p-factor uh, fits the data quite well. Uh, and that is because uh, psychopathology or uh, psychological disorders tend to also correlate positively with each other. And in this paper, we explain that if you have a positive manifold like that, like only positive correlations, then you're bound to find a higher order factor uh, from that statistical uh, artifact as well. And it doesn't necessarily mean that this statistical artifact is something real. So we argue against now searching for like the biological causes for the P factor, just like we have been searching for biological causes for the G factor without much success as well. That's what this paper is about. It shows that there might be alternative explanations to seeing this, which might include, for example, this mutualism explanation or a network model. Another paper that makes use of this uh, equivalence between latent variable models and network models is this commentary that we wrote on uh, a previous paper where fixed margin sampling was used to just uh, fit or the importance of parameters in the EC model. In fixed margin samplings, you generate new binary data from a previous binary data set while keeping the row sums and the column sums intact. So basically, you generate data while for every person, you keep the number of symptoms that the person has intact. It turns out that this is already known in the item response theory world as a way to generate data under the rush model or the one dimensional item response theory model. And that is because these row sums, these number of symptoms in total, if you generate new data while keeping that attack, access latent variable. So in this paper, we explain that if you generate data in this way, you would get clustering in the network. So basically you have a equivalent easy model, which is a fully connected network model. And then we argue that this is a reason why you probably should not use this method in, um, to judge network psychometric models, because you're already uh, simulating data under a, a uh, easy model anyway. Another line of research that uses the equivalence between latent variable models and network models a lot is this line of research from uh, Hudson Golino on exploratory graph analysis. And this is also more generally connected to how you can use networks in factor analysis. Now, this is a very uh, uh, nice uh, thing because um, the network modeling started as a way to get rid of latent variable models. Right? It started as an alternative to latent variable modeling where instead of doing latent variable modeling, we did something else. We looked at only observed data patterns and look at only relationships between observed variables. Now, Hudson Golina turned this completely on its head because he started to use these network models as a tool in factor analysis. So what he did is he looks at a network and then he looks at clustering in the network. For example, here we see different clusters and there are different algorithms that you can use to define the clusters in a network. I think here he used a walk trap algorithm. Then he uses these clusters as a, a sort of exploratory factor analysis to see which, how many factors there are and also which indicators belong to each factor. So this is basically gives you a similar result as exploratory factor analysis, except that it actually gives you uh, a, a list of factors, indicators that belong to a factor rather than uh, factor loadings that can be a bit more ambiguous. So a factor analysis can give you like a factor loading of 0.2 or 0.1. Uh, it doesn't never give you an exact zero on the factor loading. But this method does, and it shows a simulation study that this works extremely well. Also, when I teach factor analysis, and students come to me with uh, problems on their data set, and for example, okay, I have this factor model, but it doesn't fit at all. The first thing I do is I create a network picture. And this turns out to be extremely useful because the clustering will tell you a very clear story about your factor structure. If you see a picture, for example, let's say uh, this part here, these two clusters, and you see these two clusters, then that would not fit a one dimensional factor model because they're clearly two clusters. So in that way, network analysis can be a really useful tool in psychometrics 
beyond the way that we use it in other, um, uh, other session discourse. A final paper that relies heavily on the equivalence between network models and factor models is this paper I wrote earlier together with Jos Kruis and Maarten Marsman, uh, where we argue that because of this equivalence, just seeing a network model does not necessarily mean a network model is true. So here we generated data on the dilated variable model with a few uh, residuals here, which are like uh, sleep problems in both disorders. And then the true expected easy model looks like this, which is actually a nice easy model. That's like bridge symptoms and we can interpret it, but that's purely uh, artificial because you know we generated the data under the factor model. So we can interpret this as a network, but it doesn't necessarily mean that this network is true. And these are actually like bridge symptoms and things like that. Uh, then we showed what happens if you generate, let's say a thousand samples, which is quite a big data set still, but use different estimation methods. So for example, here, we used a uh, maximum likelihood estimation without any model selection. And then you see, okay, we get roughly the same picture back, but we get a lot of like negative edges and stuff as well, like spurious relationships that we might not be interested in. Here, we used easing fit, which is lasso regularization. And what you see then, easing fit always searches for uh, sparse networks and not just easing fit, any lasso method, EBCG lasso and MCM as well. So they will search for a sparse solution. So you'll get a sparse solution. But that does not necessarily mean that the sparse uh, model is true. And actually, any model selection procedure, also GDM model select, that removes edges, will give you a sparse solution with zeros in there. But in this case, there are no zeros in a true network because these are all fully connected. So we can look at structure here, but that structure is uh, uh, more or less meaningless, like that this node is connected us purely due to chance here. Finally, we used a, a method that we don't really discuss in this course, but which is low uh, rank easy model estimation, which is based on factor analysis or uh, multidimensional item response theory. And here we nicely recover these two clusters, but now we miss out on these bridging uh, connections between these uh, items that were the same. So that's just uh, to show that, okay, what you ask for, you get back. If you ask for a sparse model, you get a sparse model back. If you ask for clustering, you get clustering back. And you have to be a bit careful with that because that doesn't necessarily mean that you uncover the true model or not. Okay, that's it for this video on factor modeling and network modeling.